in a small rural village. A farmer and his wife are found dead in their home. I seen his body laying on the floor. I would have never imagined something like this. Both victims shot, both stabbed. She had some knives in her back. It was horrible. Who killed them and why so savagely? You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. We were really frightened. To catch the murderer, investigators must stake everything on a risky undercover operation. But can they coerce the ruthless killer into coming clean? Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. The small town of Enderby, British Columbia, is a place where neighbors know and trust each other. It's beautiful, the people are friendly. It's a lovely community. Most of us were dairy people, so there's dozens of little dairy farms all over Deep Creek. 48-year-old Dirk Rolf Seema grew up in the picturesque community and never saw a reason to leave. My brother Dirk was a very dedicated farmer, hardworking, always loved the farming life, I guess, and uh, it's what he knew and learned from when he was a little boy. Dirk's hard work over the years had paid off. He had a successful farm and a healthy financial nest egg, but there was something still missing from his life. He was a bachelor for a very long time. Then Audrey came across his ad in the personals section of the local newspaper. They ended up being a really good couple and got married, and that was that. They agree on everything, or almost. Audrey wanted the llamas, not Dirk. Dirk did not want llamas. But when Dirk retires from dairy farming, Audrey gets her way. How do you in love? <laughs> I think Audrey really wanted the llamas because she liked to do knitting and, and spinning and stuff. She was so excited about the spinning and the weaving and so excited about life. Audrey's no-nonsense husband is a helping hand in demand. Dirk was very meticulous and because of that he's very dependable. You knew how he would do things, you knew the end result was what you expected. So it seems out of character when on November 26, 2001, Dirk fails to show up as promised to do some work for Kevin. I tried calling him on Sunday and didn't get an answer, and his answering machine didn't come on, which was unusual because that had never happened before. I thought maybe he would show up at work Monday morning, which Monday morning come and he didn't show up. Dirk's like clockwork. I mean, if he says he's going to be there, he's going to be there. When four days later, Kevin still has not heard from Dirk. I stopped in at his place, drove into his yard, made a loop of the yard. Everything looked in order. Kevin does notice the couple's car is gone. Perhaps they'd taken an impromptu road trip. It seems unlikely, though, for such a predictable pair. Dirk would let somebody know if he was gone. Audrey, too, was missed. There were meetings and things and events with the spinning, and she just wasn't there. I was starting to suspect something was wrong. Alarm sets in when over a week goes by without family members hearing anything from the couple. Usually what he would do is he would call my mom or say, you know, he's gone for a week or going away for a few days or whatever. So and he says, that's strange. This is weird. Something's wrong here. On December 2nd, the family contacts Tony Tillert and asks him to stop by Dirk's property. I kind of already, you know, you had this little pit in my stomach, and I was almost scared to go over there, but I did. The llamas had not been fed, and it looked like they hadn't been fed for a little while. And so that's when I realized there was something really not right. He scales the home's upper porch and nervously peers into the window. I looked in. And I seen 
his body laying on the floor. And it had a blanket over it. So my thought was, oh my gosh, I hope he hasn't had a heart attack. But the reality will soon prove more horrifying than anything Dirk's friend can imagine. 911. I'm not sure what I'm seeing, but it, it's really peculiar. I can just barely see through the window, and it just appears to be a body. All right, so you think, think there is a, a body on the floor. Do you know this person? Yes, I do. He's a good friend. And what is his name? This girl, Tima. Police are quickly dispatched to the scene. And when they showed up, they just kicked the door in. So I went in with them. And that's when we discovered Wadre was in the room. The couple had been shot to death. Then viciously stabbed. The bodies were on the floor. Audrey was close to a chair. She had some knives in her back. Dirk was laying a little bit to her left. He was covered with a couple blankets. The hands of both Dirk and Audrey were duct taped, as it was their feet. Uh, and there was also some zap straps uh, around their, their wrists. Homicide detectives contact Dirk's family with the horrendous news. You know, you just don't think of anything like this ever happening. So. So it was uh, very surprised, of course, very shocked. Um, I never dreamt anything like this before in my life. Word of the murders travels through the community like wildfire. How could this happen in a small area like Enderby to two innocent people? What might have motivated such a savage crime? It was so very hard to understand, even for a minute, you know, why they were murdered. It just, nothing made sense, and it was a terrible loss. The brutality of the killings is a shock, even to seasoned investigators. You want to catch this person, and you've got to do a good job from the first minute you're there to the last minute of the investigation. The small Enderby detachment asks for help investigating the case. Lisa Stewart of British Columbia's Major Crimes Unit joins the team. Having been involved in hundreds of investigations, I know that they have twists and turns and they take on a life of their own. And this case promises to be more challenging still. Was this a crime of passion? Was this related to drugs, revenge? Who would have the motive to, to want them dead? In their home in Enderby, British Columbia, a popular couple is found dead. They had been bound with duct tape before being shot and repeatedly stabbed. It was a, quite a brutal murder. I've investigated probably 13 homicides, and uh, this was one of the, the worst ones. We have to determine what's the motive in their homicides. Had the couple been in debt to the wrong crowd? Dirk was the most honest person in the world. He wouldn't own owned anybody a penny. Is it somebody that uh, broke in to steal something from them? But there are no signs of forced entry. And when police dust for fingerprints, they find none. The smell of fuel in the home is overwhelming. The killer had doused the couple's bodies in gasoline. It appears that uh, he was trying to hide his tracks by setting the house on fire. We observed a uh, timer that was plugged into a wall, and plugged into the timer was a curling iron. This became a key part of what we call our holdback. Information not to be released to the public. The only person that would know about this was the person that had actually committed the, the murders. If you find information coming back to you that only the murderer would know, then that, you know, you're hot on the trail of the number one suspect. They hope the duct tape used to bind the victims might also provide clues, this time in the form of DNA. Also found at the scene was uh, shell casings. Dirk and Audrey had both been shot. These shell casings can be used for DNA analysis or it can also be used for firearm analysis. Investigators submit the evidence for DNA testing, knowing all too well the results are weeks away. All of a sudden, time is your enemy. 
Lisa Stewart's immediate task is to determine when the couple was killed. Speaking with friends and family, neighbors, one of the first questions that you ask them is when was the last time that you saw or heard from uh, Dirk or Audrey? We also called in uh, a forensic pathologist and she provided us an approximate timeline that the bodies had been in the house. When she tells police the couple have been dead about a week, the investigators are crestfallen. The first 24 to 48 hours are crucial in a homicide investigation. He's had seven days to either run and hide or put himself away from the area. If they plan to catch him, investigators will need to refine that timeline. We knew that his visa had been used on Saturday, uh, November 24th in Vernon area. And so I then went to the businesses where the visa transactions occurred and uh, presented the photo of Dirk. And they were able to, uh, you know, say with certainty that that's the individual who made the purchases that day. So Dirk was still alive that Saturday. What about his wife? There was a phone call to Audrey at 4 o'clock from one of her friends. And we believe that that was probably the last contact that she had with anybody prior to her murder. Given that the following day, others tried to contact the couple. And normally, you know, Audrey would pick up by the second or third ring. And if she didn't, the answer machine would pick up. But the phone rang and rang with nobody answering. In the hopes of pinpointing still further the time of the attack, investigators asked Dirk's brother, Barry Rolfsema, to join them at the victim's home. So I, I walked through the scene. I knew it happened right after supper. I could see what all the utensils and the dishes, the way they were situated, they were washed, but they weren't dried. They were still sitting there. All of it suggesting that the killer had interrupted the couple between 5 and 7 o'clock on the evening of Saturday, November 24th, then brutally murdered them. As I walked through into the living room, I see a big uh, area of blood, of course. It was difficult to see. Outside, Barry points out to police that the couple's car is missing. We felt that it would be an integral part of our investigation if we could find it. The brother also notices the nozzle is gone from the tractor fuel tank. And that the hose from the gas tank was down. And that's something his brother would have never done. Was this the source of gas used to try and ignite the farmhouse? My instinct was is that it was basically uh, somebody knew the place could be family too. You hope it's not your family, that's for sure. Dirk and Barry's younger brother is already on investigators radar. He was known to the members of Enderby Detachment. He's the black sheep, so he's done things that he should have never done in his life, associated with people that he shouldn't be associating with. This individual had a bit of a downtrodden lifestyle. He had borrowed money from his family. But they had turned off the money taps. Families are capable of doing anything when emotions are involved, even killing those that they love the most. Investigators ask the brother to come in for an interview, and though he reluctantly agrees... He was certainly raising some red flags because he wasn't being forthright, he wasn't being cooperative. We had to ascertain if he had anything financially to gain from Dirk and Audrey's homicide through the estate or, or will. Lisa Stewart is concerned by what she finds. I met with uh, Dirk and Audrey's accountant and financial planner in regards to the land, uh, the house. It would have gone to the family members of Dirk and Audrey. Including Dirk's younger brother. Police ask both siblings to provide DNA samples that will be compared to that on the duct tape found at the crime scene. Barry immediately agrees but Dirk's younger brother digs in his heels. So that, of course, puts suspicion in the police even more when somebody doesn't want to give DNA up. And obviously then, bingo, they think it's him. Anybody that's not involved would want to help the police as much as they can. Under pressure by police and family members, the brother finally cooperates. But will his DNA provide a match to that left at the scene by the killer? While they wait for DNA results, Lisa Stewart looks into another relationship that may have gone sour, this time between Dirk and his neighbor. 
He had a very large dairy operation, but he didn't have enough land to support the cattle, to feed them. So he had a lease agreement with Dirk for his property to use to feed the cows. But the man hadn't won many friends in the community. He wasn't a very popular person, and I think that a lot of people saw him as all about business and not about relationships. In fact, the neighbor may have been contacted about a very lucrative new business using the land he leased from Dirk. He had been approached by two males described to us as biker looking. They had uh, come to the property uh, to negotiate a business transaction to have a marijuana grow up on the property. Was Dirk about to set his neighbors straight? If Dirk decided not to lease him, you know, any more of his land, that that would have, you know, basically been the end of his business. Could that have been the motive for murder? Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. Sergeant Lisa Stewart is en route to meet with the neighbor of murder victims Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema. As an investigator, you think, OK, is there a motive here? Does he have anything to gain by their homicides? The man may have been contacted about an illegal grow up on the land he leased from Dirk. So when we hear a grow up is potentially involved in the investigation, it certainly raises our suspicions. I met with him at his property, and I said, you know that I'm speaking with numerous witnesses. The neighbor is surprisingly open about his conflicts with Dirk. I think he wanted to be seen as cooperating with the investigation. She confronts him about the alleged grow up. I've learned that two possibly Hell's Angels approached you to do a grow up. Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. And his response was, no, that's ridiculous. You know, never happened. He allowed me to look around the property. There was no signs of a grow up anywhere on the property. What's more, the man's alibi around the time of the murders turns out to be airtight. The neighbor was able to say, on these days I was here, and uh, we were able to substantiate that. The man is cleared, but not before telling investigators about a farmhand who'd once locked horns with Dirk Rolf Sima. And so this individual, who we later learned to be Renee Therion, had lived on Dirk and Audrey's property for approximately a year. Dirk had a, a rental trailer, and uh, Renee had lived in this trailer. We had to move on to doing some background on Renee and his activities. Police discover a long simmering conflict between Renee and Dirk. The dispute was very volatile. They were both very angry. Their fight had started one year earlier when Renee headed home to Quebec to visit family. When he left, the weather was below zero, freezing. During that period of time, the oil tank had gone low. Dirk, he was concerned about the place freezing. So Dirk, as the landlord, went into the trailer and, and uh, checked on the pipes and made sure that they were fine. When Rene came back, he was so mad that he was going to phone the police. He was quite uh, taken aback that uh, Dirk had the audacity, basically, to go into his uh, trailer without his permission. So there ensued this big battle between Renee and Dirk, and Dirk wouldn't back down. Finally, in February of 2001, nine months before the murders, Dirk served Renee with eviction papers. But that didn't end things. Renee was still working at the farm that was close by, so there was still friction there. Renee's feud with Dirk hardly seems proof of murder. But in the days following the discovery of the bodies and disappearance of the couple's car, Rene had made some suspicious comments. Rene had been working on some large dairy farms, and these dairy farms, of course, have uh, large manure pits. Rene had made the comment, they're never going to find that car. Rene had said, well, if I would uh, hide a car, I would put it in the manure pit. Sergeant Stewart decides to pay Rene a visit at his current home a motel on the highway. His grasp of the English language wasn't that great, so, you know, we're trying to communicate with one another as best as I can. And she asked Rene about his altercation with Dirk. He was adamant that he had not left the tank um, 
run dry or, or very low. So he felt that Dirk used that as an excuse to actually go into his trailer and snoop around. Here it was, you know, a year later, and he was still animated, you know, and trying to defend his position, and that Dirk was in the wrong. But Rene insists that the disagreement was never so serious that he would resort to violence, much less murder. What's more, he was at work milking the cows the day the couple was killed. And he can prove it. He pulled out a calendar, and he had it marked with all of his shifts, that he worked, you know, a day shift or an afternoon shift or an evening. I mean, he worked very long hours. So in essence, he's providing us an alibi. But is he willing to provide a sample of his DNA? He wanted to speak with a lawyer, and I said, by all means, you know, speak with a lawyer. Um, you should know what your rights are before you voluntarily provide a sample of your DNA. A few days later, Rene shows up at the police station. We went over the consent form, which clearly lays out that it's voluntary and that, you know, it's not being forced upon him. And uh, he provided a, a sample of his DNA. Meanwhile, the test results of another sample are already in this time from Dirk's younger brother. The DNA never came back to, to him, so it eliminated him as far as DNA. We also were able to do a polygraph, and uh, he passed the polygraph. He was found to be truthful in that he did not murder his brother and his wife. Is this the man who did? The surveillance footage showed a male dressed in fatigues with a bandana pulled up over his face. You don't know if he's your neighbor. You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. Investigators are under the gun to find the vicious killer of Enderby residents Dirk and Audrey Rolf Sima. We were frightened. We were really frightened. You start locking your doors and you feel very apprehensive because you just don't know if this is somebody going around killing people for no other reason than to kill somebody. The community became more suspicious of any strangers. Could be anybody. The peaceful townspeople are in a state of panic. So they call in saying there's a fellow riding a mountain bike down the street, and he's got his uh, toque down low, and we don't recognize him. He's a local person that just happens to be riding his bike. There was a lot of gossip and rumor and innuendo going around town that we as investigators had to filter through to establish what's fact and what's fiction. Pressure from the community? Sure there was. Pressure from the community, this had to be solved. Might the couple's missing car provide police with a much needed break in the case? The person that's driving it may be responsible for the murder. Helicopters scour the area in search of the vehicle, and investigators appeal to the public for their help in finding it. The police are looking for a little black Honda. We're very interested in it. It's missing from a homicide scene. All of a sudden, we start getting phone calls from all over British Columbia saying, we've seen this little black Honda. It was seen in Vancouver. It was seen on its way to Prince George. It was seen in Kelowna. While Stewart follows up on the thousands of tips, Pitt goes after surveillance footage from the area. And we had asked the detachments, the police agencies on the road especially, to go to the businesses and to gather all the tapes they could. Including those from the nearest toll booth. I think it is some like 140 hours of videotape had to be watched to see if that little black Honda went through the toll booth. Investigators receive hundreds of sightings, but to their disappointment, none lead them to the couple's missing vehicle. Did the killer, as Rene Terrian had suggested, sink the car in a local manure pit? The pit we're talking about is massive. It just, it would not just hold a little car. It could hold a semi-truck. Police have the pit drained, but to their disappointment. At the end of the day, there's no car in the bottom. It is just the investigation that's stuck in the mud. A lot of time was taken on trying to find this little car. You kind of get the feeling like, okay, this is gonna be a lengthy investigation. 
On December 10th, eight days after the discovery of their bodies, family and friends gather for a tearful remembrance service for Dirk and Audrey. She was a good friend, a good person. She was kind. I miss her. The community's grief made worse by the knowledge the killer is still on the loose. You don't know if he's your neighbor. You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. I kept in contact with the police weekly. I said to him that I would phone him once a week until the day that it's solved. I myself spoke to Barry probably several times a week just to say, you know, we haven't forgotten you guys. You know, we're still working. We're still, we're still plugging away. Investigators get access to Dirk and Audrey's banking records and discover a series of withdrawals shortly after the couple was killed. We knew that Audrey's ATM card had been used in the early morning hours shortly after midnight on the 25th of November. And it had been used at a credit union in Armstrong as well. The news brings with it the terrible realization that the torture of Dirk and Audrey was coldly calculated. He had them tied up and duct taped to make sure that he could try to get their PIN numbers for their cards. His ruthless scheme hardly worth the payoff. The first withdrawal was for $80. The second one was for $100. The surveillance footage from the credit union showed a male dressed in fatigues. You could see some type of disguise over his uh, facial features. At an ATM located in a convenience store, the video was actually concentrated on the front door. But just one minute before a withdrawal from Audrey's account. You have one person coming through the front door. He goes out of sight of the video. So we didn't actually have him doing the transaction. Could this be Dirk and Audrey's killer? It looks like maybe he shed his overcoat and his mask, and uh, he has a gray hoodie on. The poor quality of the image makes it difficult to identify the man. So we had to draw an image off of the video. Then we had to try to enhance the picture so that it was usable to show to people. Using our police computer system, we put the video out to all the local RCMP. Hopefully somebody out there may know this individual. A rookie cop gets the shock of her life when she opens her email and sees a picture of a friend. Right away, I recognize the person, René Terrier. RCMP officer Joanne Wursta may have identified the man investigators suspect withdrew money from the account of murder victim Audrey Rolfsima. Working in a small community uh, in the Okanagan and being French-Canadian, there's not many people speaking French uh, in that area. When I was introduced to him, I knew that he was working uh, on a farm uh, in Enderby. I believe he said it was a dairy farm. His full name was uh, René Terrien. Dirk Rolfsima's disgruntled former tenant. But not only does René have an alibi for the day of the double homicide, he was a very laid-back guy, very friendly, just ordinary guy. Are police focusing in on the wrong suspect? Being a police officer, usually you're a very good judge of character, and I would have never thought in a million years that uh, he would get in trouble in any way. Investigators will need more than this to prove it. So we have him coming into the store, seconds before the bank card is used, but we didn't have any photographs of him using it. How do we know that he's not there to get a quart of milk? You're building, um, I guess you could say, a circumstantial case. These are suspicions, and they're important pieces of circumstantial evidence, but it doesn't add up to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But it still didn't put Rene committing the actual murders. The farmhand maintains he was at work milking when the murders occurred. Can investigators prove otherwise? We had determined that most likely Dirk and Audrey were killed after they had had supper on the 24th. We knew from the autopsy results that they had just recently consumed uh, a large meal. So that really narrowed down the time frame for us. 
If Rene worked a full shift that day, how could he possibly have found time to kill the couple? Rene worked a split shift. Uh, so his first shift in the morning was from 11.30 to 4.30, and then his second shift was from 7.30 to 11.30 at night. We believe between the afternoon and the evening milkings, that's when the murder occurred. So it basically gave him a timeline of three hours to actually commit the murders. And what about the timing of the ATM withdrawal late that night? He indicated to us that uh, he worked till 12.30, but all the computer records for the milking showed that he actually milked the last cow at 11.30 that night. Anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to clean up, he could have left that farm by midnight. Does he have time to go do the ATM transaction at 25 after? Although investigators have videos showing a man in the store that looks like Rene, they need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt he had time to get there. I drove the back roads doing the average speed limit, and I arrived in Armstrong within 18 minutes. It was a part of the puzzle against Rene, but it wasn't enough to arrest him. So why is the farmhand in such a hurry to get out of town? Rene had also given his resignation letter, which really came out of nowhere for the employer. Who quits their job when they have a good paying job and he's getting nervous. Investigators return to Rene's motel, only to discover that he's already moved out and moved on. Why? Why did he want to leave town? Back at the detachment, police receive a crucial report from the firearms lab. At the crime scene, there was a 22 casing found. Our firearms lab was able to tell us that the 22 casing was uh, shot by a very rare gun. We also received a photograph of what the firearm would look like. It was a military-style weapon. There was eight Calico-registered firearms in Canada. We sent uh, police officers to all eight residences in, in Canada, uh, and there was one in the, uh, the Maritimes and he said, I no longer have it. I sold it to a guy by the name of Rene. Rene Terrian. But did he still own the gun? Lisa Stewart follows up on a tip. Lisa went and talked to uh, the neighbor's boys who worked on the farm with Rene. When I spoke with um, the sons, you know, they had um, observed Rene with a 22 caliber rifle. One of the, the cows was sick and had to be put down. So Rene said, I've got a gun. So he went and got his gun and, uh, and put the cow down. One of the neighbor's boys distinctly remembers the firearm. I had him draw a picture of it, which he did in my notebook. Just from that drawing alone, I was like, yeah, that's the firearm. Top loading 22s are quite unique. It certainly put him as the number one suspect. But again, police will need more to make an arrest. We still needed to prove that Rene was the one that pulled the trigger. Will Rene's long-awaited DNA results seal the deal? The odds were one in 9.1 trillion. Four weeks into their investigation, Police link the rare 22 caliber rifle used to kill Dirk and Audrey Rolfsima to farmhand Rene Terrian. The pieces of the puzzle started coming together. I mean, we're finding out that he has the same weapon. They already know Rene held a grudge against Dirk for entering his trailer, then evicting him from it. Now, Sergeant Ewan Pitt has discovered what may be an additional motivation for the murder. And the Credit Bureau gave us a baseline as to other debts he may have accumulated over years. He had a Dodge pickup, and there was a, a debt on that. He had a number of bank accounts in downtown Salmon Arm. You could see that during the month of December, he was starting to miss some of his payments. Had Rene Terrian, desperate for cash, resorted to cold-blooded killing? We received a report back from the lab that they had found uh, a male profile on the duct tape used to bind Audrey's legs. And they'd compared it to the DNA offered up by the farmhand. And that profile came back as a match to Rene Terrian. 
But even the DNA results are circumstantial evidence. The duct tape doesn't say that he's the killer. All that shows is that, in this case, Mr. Terrian touched the duct tape at some point. The fact is, is he had rented a trailer on their property for months, and so there was any number of innocent possibilities for how that came to be there. The other piece of circumstantial evidence that came into effect in this case was that um, their bank cards were used. And unfortunately, the person who was using the, the bank machine had a mask covering his face. So that didn't tell us who it is. As for the withdrawal at the ATM in the convenience store, He's coming into the store. We don't, he's not actually using the bank card. Those were two important bits, but they weren't enough to lay charges. And they certainly wouldn't have been enough to prosecute. And we felt that we should further investigation to make sure that if we were gonna lay a charge, that we wanted to be 100% positive that we would get a conviction at the end of the day. Months pass, but investigators seem no closer to proving the former farmhand is Dirk and Audrey Rolf Sima's killer. Mr. Terrian had moved back to Quebec by this point, and all of their other leads had gone cold. That the killer is still at large gnaws away at the police and the community. Some of the neighbors, they would maybe criticize the, the investigators or the police because it wasn't happening fast enough. You know, this should be dealt with you know, in short order. Well, when you try to explain to them that, uh, you know, these types of investigations do take time and you've got to understand that. Finally, in December of 2002, a year after the murders, another officer and myself went down to Quebec and launch a crack undercover operation they hope will see Rene admit to the murders. As time goes on, if they haven't been caught, they feel a little bit more at ease. And so that's to our advantage. Agents posing as criminals carefully court him. They are trying to get Rene to be part of their group. And in order to get the job in the organization, you have to be absolutely clean with uh, no baggage. They are trying to get Rene to speak freely about uh, things that he's done in the past. If you've got any problem that the police are going to be looking into is tell us because we could make it go away. But you have to tell us the details. Like it's a chess game, you know, and, and we're being very strategic. In this case, it took, I believe it was about seven months to get Rene to have the confidence in the undercover operators to be friends, to be their pals. That's when investigators make their move asking Rene to attend a crucial meeting with Mr. Big, the supposed head of the illicit operation. Bob Gobel watches from a nearby room. First, Rene admits to killing the couple. Then... I came back and I cut her down. And I put some gas up there and on the sofa and I went to Armstrong. There were a number of holdback uh, bits of evidence, and Mr. Terrian was able to give it all and correctly. He probably brought out four or five points only he would have known. And of course, the biggest one was uh, the timer and the curling iron. I went back after I put the timer. I found the iron there, and I said, oh, it might be worth it. And I have to cover what I did. He said that he had set the timer when he was leaving, the timer would go off, the house would start on fire, and all the evidence would be destroyed. I should try the timer first, you know? Probably one of the biggest shocks he ever got was when he came back and that house was still standing. Investigators finally have Rene Terrian where they want him. When you're sitting in a couple rooms over, watching on a monitor, him confessing, or telling you your whole back that, that only three or four of you have, have known for three years, I mean, that's something that you'll never forget. But police are still missing one crucial piece of evidence. The helicopter couldn't find it. Our search and rescue people couldn't find where was the car. A painstaking undercover operation has seen suspect Rene Terrian revealing information only the killer of this couple would know. I came back and I cut her down. And I put some gas up there. But is Terrian's confession enough to convict him of the crime? We don't want to run the risk of having a defense lawyer uh, attack our investigation and have things thrown out. 
the team decides to go after one final piece of the puzzle. One of the things that Rene revealed in his interview with Mr. Big was that he had hidden the car and that he had hidden it that, that nobody would ever find it. Mr. Big convinces Rene he must destroy all evidence of the murders. Rene falls for their ruse and leads them back to BC. And one of the first things that we had him do was point out to our undercover operators to where the car was. And, you know, it was within a highly wooded area. It's up a little forestry road with a huge, deep ravine with lots of uh, cedar trees. And Rene said after he had committed the murders, he had gotten in the car, driven it up this road, and uh, just basically pushed it off the cliff. And that's where it was. And in fact, a tree had fallen on it. So that's why when the search and rescue had gone out in an effort to locate the vehicle, they couldn't see it from the air because it was concealed by, uh, by the tree. It is the final piece of indisputable evidence the investigators need. The following day, the undercover operator told Rene to meet him at a gas station in West Kelowna. Myself and another police officer, we walked in and I arrested him for uh, the first degree murder of both Audrey and Dirk. After three years of intense investigation, Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema's killer has finally been caught. It was satisfying. Yeah, it was satisfying. It was a big relief when there was an arrest. Now in police custody, Rene confesses to investigators, casually relating how he ruthlessly murdered the couple. He's kind of scared, but she wasn't, you know, he's the big guy, but she kind of got the balls for that then I punch her. And it's like, you know, then got no turning back, you know, so that then I shoot. Was it just unfortunate that Audrey was there? Yeah. Because you didn't mind her. No, right? Not she was sure. okay. Yeah. But you, you found yourself in a position where once you decided to go beyond that point of no return, mm -hmm. you couldn't stop that just him, right? No. And on November 5th, 2006, nearly five years after their deaths, Rene Terrian pleads guilty to the second degree murders of Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema. He is sentenced to 18 years in prison with no chance of parole. To this day, myself and the other investigators, we never really knew what the motive was. Was it financial? Well, financial, what did he get? A couple hundred bucks, you know? Was it anger or was it hatred? Only Rene knows, and he's never told us. With the killer safely behind bars, Family and friends commemorate the couple at their favorite spot in Enderby. It's just a little memorial of a picture of Dirk and Audrey. And, uh... Time heals, but you don't forget. He robbed them of an amazing life together. There's nothing anybody can do to give that back. People always say, well, it brings closure to the family. It never does. It just doesn't. In 2007, the investigators received a special commendation from the Crown Prosecutor for their hard work and exceptional diligence. It's important to say well done and thank you when it's deserving, and uh, they certainly deserved it in this case. We have a job to do. People rely on us, and the satisfaction from meeting with the families afterwards and having them thank us. That's all it's all about.